<laughs> Does anybody know why we're here? So good, yeah. First, welcome everybody here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschken. I'm the director of the program, the Bridge Academia in Professional Theater, International and American Theater. But tonight, we're going to celebrate the legacy of great places in New York City. I think places that made the city what they were and something we terribly miss now, especially, of course, in the time of Corona. But still, there's something to really learn from these times and to reconnect and rethink what is important, what is essential. And I think this was um, one of the ideas. I would like to thank John Jesseron, um, who will be on the second panel for coming uh, to me and said, Frank, there's this book is out. You have to do an evening. And I listened to John. So, um, so this is, of course, I knew about it. I also was once there briefly and saw John's work there. Um, so it's a great honor uh, for us to have you all here. We just had a really, I think it's great uh, uh, experience in listening to the creators of the Club 57 and to the people who made it and who were there. So I would like to thank you all again for participating. And now it's the second uh, follow-up and also chronologically, I think it does fit. It Pyramid came afterwards and there are strong connections, but we will hear um, all about it. Um, Kestutis will take over with the moderation. I will be here, but uh, maybe we start um, as always, with the introduction, who you are, maybe start with you and then come through here and then uh, we go on. So here we go. And thank you all for coming. We need great theater, great places, but great audiences too. Thank you. And, and thanks, Frank, so much for having us here at the Siegel Center. It's very well appreciated. And, uh, you know, we are people who still very much love the pyramid and its legacy and um, that's why the book, it was a labor of love always and uh, uh, a, a deep need to tell some untold stories and some told stories too. But definitely uh, 57 was a great predecessor to uh, Pyramid. They were different, but there was definite overlap and, uh, and a lot of commonality as well. So, um, and so, um, I'm just going to quickly, people who've come to these events as this book is probably sick of hearing me read Step Inside, but for those who are less familiar with the pyramid, I want to read this little two-page intro to the book because it paints a picture of what the place was like to, to a lot of us who, who you know, were there. Uh, so here it goes. This is from the beginning of the book. Step Inside. All day, night, you worked your shit New York job at the office, bookstore, messenger service, restaurant, nightclub. Maybe you quit. You can find another job. Maybe you were high, drunk last night. You still have more than $80 to make, to make it till the rent is due in three weeks. Your body aches. You spent one of your dollars for mushroom barley soup and buttered challah bread at Kiev for your 6 p.m. lunch. You worked on your band, comic book, monologue, design, play, film, painting, poems, graffiti, flyer, all afternoon. Your boy, girlfriend is somewhere else. Night has come. Your senses are sharp. You know what's out there. Soon you're dressed and heading east. Straighter friends said you were crazy to live east of 2nd Avenue. Do you want to get shot? CBGB's is over and you're not that comfortable at Club 57 anymore. You don't wear all black anymore. You can wear what's fun, something masculine, feminine. A trash can lid crashes down the block as you cross First Avenue. The only other soul on the avenue is the plastic cap bum rifling through the garbage. You scoffed when they said it was dangerous over here, but you're walking fast anyway. You turn a corner onto 7th Street heading toward Avenue A. The spires of the Polish church rise to the full moon. The six foot two black drag queen half a block ahead struts on unafraid. She taunts back at hassling teens. More garbage can lids crash ahead, but he, she carries on. The Ukrainian and Puerto Rican youths fix their gaze on you. All the storefronts are empty. Some still have Yiddish writing or faded pictures from a vanished world. While you were dreaming, you forgot your fear. You were almost at Avenue A. Leszko's coffee shop with its Polish and Ukrainian home cooking is still open on the corner. You turn right 
and walk to the dead looking bar at 101 Avenue A. The door opens. You hear your name announced loudly over a microphone. Applause erupts from the crowd at the long bar stretched out before you. Even the boys dancing on the bar are clapping. You look down the bar and see that it was Tanya Ransom, AKA Michael Norman, who has announced your name. He, she is holding their trademark Cape Cod high in a toast to you. Here, you are a star. This is your Pyramid Cocktail Lounge. When the door opens again, the next patron is announced. The whole place erupts again, but you don't mind. Let her, him be as famous as you. Let's all be famous together, gay and straight, black, white, and brown, artists and art lovers. This is why you came to New York. We have found our place, the pyramid. Where's Bobby? Downstairs, says sister, his boyfriend. You head down the steps to visit the manager. The stairwell still smells like the smoke and spilled beer of most of the 20th century. The basement is more finished than ever when an ancient Manhattan Creek ran across the dirt floor. You cross the dark room, past the drug dealers and the drag queens toward Bobby's office. It's a closet-sized cubicle hastily nailed together out of plywood. You knock. Just a minute. Bobby Bradley, a boyish, brown-haired 23-year-old, opens the door, a few flakes of white powder still stuck under his nose. I was just going to call you, he says. You step into his cubicle and sit cramped in the tiny area with its makeshift desk. Above you is a big paper planning calendar, penciled into each square as a night's worth of programming, bands, plays, solo performances, variety acts. Bobby asks you if you want to do something, and you say yes. He lays several healthy-sized lines of coke before your hungry eyes, and you snort. He asks you the name of your piece, and you make something up. Your mind races. You and Bobby are talking fast, and neither of you is listening much, but together you invent your show. Tonight, you will leave this place with a booking, a New York success. Good, you think. If enough people come, and they will, you can make your next month's rent just in time. Bobby is laying out another line as the door knocks. Just a minute. You hastily snort up the powder as Bobby opens the door. An eager face peers in. I was just going to call you. Bobby lets the next artist, Bohemian, into his office. You go out. Soon the newcomer will have his, her booking too. You bound back up the stairs to the main floor. By the bar, you light a cigarette. The club looks more beautiful than ever with its instant decor of foam core and tinsel and its beautiful bar dancing boys, boys dressed as girls, and maybe even a girl. It's going to be quite a night. Um, so that's, I mean, you know, when we talk about the pyramid, it's all, there's a lot of people, including me, who say it was home. We got there and we felt we were home but it was home on a very special day, like on your birthday. And it was always, <laughs> that's how it felt. You know, it, it is your birthday and it's a, it's a, it's a great one. So on, on the panel now are our, you know, we got two little panels here and they're loosely configured. We wanna kind of focus on the origins with this first panel. And the idea here is, you know, when people like me came into the pyramid, that was already 1983. So maybe, going for a couple of years. So yeah. Introduce yourself because oh, everybody absolutely. knows who you are. Uh, we have many visitors on sure. you. Welcome them yeah. from HowlRound um, with us. Just we do introduce and also who you are and sure. what you do. Okay, thanks, Frank. Sorry, I get carried away. Um, I, I'm Kistutis Nakas, and I'm one of the three co-authors of the book with the late Brian Butterick, also known as Hattie Hathaway, and Susan Martin. Um, and uh, I've always wanted to write this book. Our panel here, and the first part of this panel, they'll introduce themselves as they speak. But I wanted to, what I was going to say was when people like me walked in, um, you know, a year and a half after it was going, we already, we already, we walked into what I just described, you know, something that was going full speed. Um, but the people, people like Peter and John, we're in on the very beginning, the, the club as it was being conceived. John performed on opening night. Peter helped plan the opening night event. Peter knew 
Bobby and sister, the two founders of the club, when they were still students in Charleston. So it, to me, and, and that's what part of why I wanted to write the book and tell the story. It's one thing for a, a Castudis or a Taboo or, you know, a Philly to walk in and go, oh, this is where I want to do stuff. But there are people who built the thing that we wanted to do. And then Samoa, who came from Japan, just to explore New York and who found it, I think you were already there, but it, it hadn't even been going six months when you found when you found the pyramid, right, Samoa? So why don't we begin with Peter? Yeah, sorry. What? It wasn't even staged. It was a plywood. Oh, you were this tall. Yeah. Yeah, OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so the must <Masiori>. hurry. <laughs> Got it. Let's start with Peter, because he starts the earliest in South Carolina. We'll go to John, and then we'll go to Samoa. And, and you know, tell us the story and, and whatever else. Well, I think one of the, the consistent themes in your book, and I agree with this, is that the pyramid was an outgrowth of the personality of this young man named Bobby Bradley, and who was a paradoxical figure. Um, and he was a kid. Um, I was working at the Spoleto Festival, and he and his boyfriend, um, sister, uh, were students, and they came to the festival. The festival takes place all over the city. And Bobby was very good at getting to know people um, in one way or another. Um, and uh, yeah, wink, wink. Yeah. And um, um, they, they, they I, I wouldn't say they followed me up to New York, but, but when I returned to New York, they arrived in New York and they stayed with me for a few days. And um, Bobby just had this very uh, large personality and he um, was not above using it in any way that he could. But the, the, the great thing about Bobby, the genius of Bobby, was that he was also very generous and, um, and, and, and open-minded about what could work. And, and he really, and when I'm reading the book, I was thinking about how um, focused he was at the same time that he was doing drugs and you know self-destructing in, in many ways he 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 had an idea about this club that he wanted to um uh, achieve and he just applied himself to it and um and and but just by saying yes and it really didn't have much to do with uh, a um, developed or sophisticated sense of what he wanted to present um, that wasn't what he was about. Um, so anyway, maybe that's a, a way to yeah. introduce the subject. So then you were also a performer, or you were? Sorry? Uh, you were also a performer, I, you I, ran I, the club. What is your I, kind of I'm a stage director, playwright, theater artist kind of person. I, I, I learned a lot of how I was going to approach the theater at the Pyramid. And um, I was a little older uh, than a lot of the people there. In some ways, the pyramid was, I mean, I said this to John, and, he, and he, I don't think he liked it very much, but it was a little like a fraternity house. Um, it, 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 was, it was a place where young people could gather, and maybe the kind of outsiders that, that went there, you know, they didn't have a fraternity house. So the pyramid was a safe harbor where people could go and be free and play out all their desires and their youth sort of on the precipice of, of adulthood, of actually facing what the world is about, the limitations of the world. And I was already sort of thinking about those things. And I, I wasn't, I, I'm not really a partier. Um, what I was focused on in the pyramid were these other performers uh, that were already uh, masters of their trade. John being the foremost, um, w when I met John, I, I just couldn't believe that anyone could be that talented. And, and y y uh, your ability to mutate and just sort of shape shift um, astounded me. But as I got to know John more, I realized that he also ha just had this, this handle on the whole, his, you know, the whole hi cultural history of, of Western civilization, on um, performance technique, you were trained as a, as a dancer um, and an artist, but there were certain things that you were able to do that I, I wanted to learn. 
And the, the first one was just how to be present. And, and in, in a room that's noisy and full of all kinds of distractions, how it is that you just cut, kind of walked in and cut through with the aid of, you know, a loud recording of Maria Callas or something, um, and created a reality that everybody was galvanized by. Um, I was also felt that way about Chang and, Ago and Avoid Moon. The, the, there was a something ineffable about the style, and I wondered, it was, it was cool. I was not especially cool. Um, I wondered how you got it. And so I, I would go time after time after time just to take it in. And then, of course, the great master of the pyramid was Ethel Eichelberger. And uh, this is a person who, um, you know, summoned up all of Western civilization in, in her performance and embodying these, these women. Um, um, so that's what I was paying attention to. And, and to me, that's really what the pyramid was about. Bobby, it, that's enough, yeah. Yeah, well, let's go then to that opening night. And you had a great segue into John's stuff. So John, you tell us from opening night on and, and then whatever else, please. Um, I'm John Kelly, hello. And uh, but the re Peter, the reason I, w I never felt comfortable in a frat house. That's why I, <laughs> I didn't either. The other thing, I've never been in a frat house. I haven't either. I didn't. So anyway, yes, uh, and I, I, but it made me think of beer, which made me happy. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, I um, let me just tell you a tiny bit about my past. I, I uh, grew up as a visual artist in Jersey City. I escaped as soon as I could. I got a scholarship at American Ballet Theater School and, and began my ballet training danced with some small modern dance companies, but really I started too late. So I eventually quit dancing, went to Parsons School of Design, redeemed myself by becoming a really good draftsman, quit Parsons, went to East Village. I was there, you know, drawing in clubs, making self-portraits. I got at the Anvil with my then partner, and I, and I used to sketch at the Anvil above the, the perch. And I saw Tanya Ransom performing, lip-syncing Nina Hagen, and that changed my life literally changed my life. So I started hanging around with T Tanya, uh, performing in punk drag. I performed at the Anvil, Lip Syncing Callas' Habanera. We performed at Cafe Schmidt and at, at the Mud Club. And then I hung out at the bar, which was on 4th Street and 2nd Avenue, which was like a, an incredible salon. And I, I one night, I, you introduced me, I think, to Bobby Bradley. And Bobby's like, you know, I'm doing this uh, I'm opening a club, and do you have a, a performance you might be working on? I was like, yeah, I'm working on the, the martyrdom of St. Sebastian. He loved that. So that's what I did on opening night in a kind of upside-down bustier with a half-slip and a teased-out red wig, very gender fuck. And, um, and that, the pyramid became my schooling. My, my uh, life was able to be focused in, in that space with all these amazing artists. And it was just an incredible, lucky thing to be a part of. That's great. And, and Samoa, so you came from Japan to explore New York. Yeah. So tell us that story. Uh, so um, I was born in Japan, uh, Hiroshima, Japan. And um, I left there uh, when I was 18. Oh, no, that's not true. 19 or 20. Then I came to directly to New York. And um, I have no idea what New York was. I came here in 1980, and uh, I had a friend, and he told me to get the Village Voice, and it opened the back page of the Village Voice, and there was a club listing, and then you go from the top to the bottom, then go to the next page and go to the top to the bottom. Find out what you like. And then I was like, oh, yeah, okay, sounds good. <clears throat> so I was like a out night clubbing for like a weeks. It took me like a few weeks to get to Pyramid. Um, because I was at, uh, I encountered like a after hours club. And then there was a 6th Street and 1st Avenue. And it was a laundromat or bar. I don't remember it was a laundromat. And now it's like Dunkin' Donuts. But in the basement, they opened a bar, and then nobody knew like bar was there. But so I go down there, and um, this one guy, 
and he was saying ecstasy. I mean, he, he was just like sort of showed me the ecstasy and then gave me this real tiny square paper and it said 101 Avenue A and then flip the other side and it said not for everyone. And then he gave me this paper and then it's like, what is this? And, and he goes, hey, you find out, you go there, you find out. So I did, um, next day, I was living in Upper West Side at the time, and then I came down, I went to Pyramid. Um, this was like a four, three, four weeks of night clubbing every night. Like I went to, literally, I went to Peppermint Lounge, opening night of Peppermint Lounge, it was in Midtown, so it was like a long time ago. and. Um, you know, I saw cramps and all, all that stuff, and then I was like, sort of ready for something. But I, I you know, I went to uh, Pyramid next day, I walked into the bar, and it was a happy hour, and there was no sound. I think there was a John Tucker, it was a, a early button, I could be wrong. But it, they had a um, record player on the bar. And then it was a, a vinyl on the bar. And then she was serving drinks and then asking the uh, people to play the records. Like, can, can you just uh, play some records? And then it was kind of funny, you know, and it was a low tech and everything. And the speaker was on the counter. So it was literally, they, they brought stereo system on the bar and then then I, then I went to the back room, and it was a kind of dark. I went to the back room. Then um, I saw John Kelly and Tyne Ransom and then Frederick, the three men. They were men. It was afternoon. And uh, uh, rehearsing some, like, uh, I remember you guys were doing like a train. It was uh, supposed to be you guys was on the train. Not dancing on a train. Yeah, that, and train then train. had a long fabric, like a light fabric, and there was a big fan growing. And then there, you guys was out the window talking to each other, but it was on the train. And, it, and then there was a, like I said, the stage was a, a two four by eight plywood with a two by four framing. So it was like a literally like this high. And then two of them. It wasn't it wasn't really a stage, but it just kind of like a lifted up a little. And then they were doing this rehearsal. And uh, I couldn't even speak English, like, you know, like I just alive and then I couldn't speak English. And then I was shocked. I was kind of like, what is going on here? And, and then I stayed the whole entire rehearsal. And uh, I think Tanya just sort of invited me to the basement, like kind of like, uh, come down here. And then I was like, a, go down there. And then it was like a totally mess, like debris everywhere <laughs> still. And um, then they told me to come back, like I mean, come back tonight. So it was like, oh, okay, I'll come back tonight. And then sort of like they, they took me in, like a John, Tanya, and the Frederick took me in. I couldn't even speak English. And then I learned, like, um, I observed, you know, first I literally, I was shocked, literally. Like, this can't be true. But in, in the same time, I, I found my home, like the kind of literally I knew this 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 was it. This is what I was looking for. The the bridge voice like I went to everywhere, literally everywhere. I went to Crop fifty seven too. But but can, can, quite can, a, I, yeah. can I say something just about the opening night? Yes, please. The beginning, the very beginning. Beca uh, because you know, we tend to look at the pyramid as it was formed, um, but it, <clears throat> it was very much make it up as you go along. 
And um, Bobby had this idea for Thursday night, and, and, you know, a number of us were skeptical. But we went along with it. And I remember a sister came over to my house, and we made a mixtape of Ella Fitzgerald songs and things like that. Um, it was very much try something and see what sticks. And, um, and that continued for a long time. In fact, I think it, it continued for the whole history of the pyramid. And um, there was something about Bobby. He was extremely um, charismatic. And I think for a lot of gay men, he was sexy. Um, but he kind of used it, as I say, generously. Um, yeah. uh, he brought people in. Um, he, he made it seem like it was something. Um, is it something or is it nothing? Uh, nine times out of ten, uh, an effort like that would have fizzled, um, but somehow it just sort of built one thing uh, after another. I, I, you know, how it is, John, that you got involved or how it is that different people came into it and saw that it was something and thought that they could ap apply themselves to it. That had a lot to do with the... And, and, I mean, you were there that opening night. I, you know, I wasn't, and, but I know Brian's description. Uh, it was full of people that, you know, there had been magically appeared in the Soho News, uh, like a puff piece, this place is going to open, you should be there. Uh, but also Phoebe Legere had a bit of a following. She played, uh, and, and Bobby created this event where when Phoebe walked in, all these so-called reporters and paparazzi were there and all these flash cubes went off and stuff like that. So he had an idea of making an event, but it just, it j and they had a whole scenario that was written out on these programs uh, that really was postmodern. It made no sense. But, you know, it just, there was, and the, with the gay, you know, you mentioned the gay thing and the bringing people in, you know, but it wasn't, it was everybody who kind of was out of place in the West Village. And for straight artists who, that, you know, because punk was kind of dying, but at least that first wave of it from CBGBs. So a lot of us who used to go to CBGBs uh, weren't, you know, had, had no place to go. And we'd go into the pyramid and be like, oh, oh, you know, this is great. And so, but all these people were kind of fully formed. You know, we, we mentioned, I had a cable TV show and a lot of the Club 57 people came on and they were like a first wave of people that came on that show. And then another wave started coming on. Somebody told me about this video artist named Tom Rubnitz who had this gang of people he was working with and so on to the TV show, which was a, like a real low rent public access cable TV show that we deliberately made look as cheap as possible but on came John Kelly, and on came Tanya Ransom, and uh, and and you know John Sex, who was had been a '57 person, started saying, "Oh, you should go to the pyramid. You should go to the pyramid." So there was this overlap, and but but Bobby, who um, and I'll shut up in a second, but Bobby, who you know loved performers, loved all the ideas that could flash off performance. You know, Bobby would kind of collar you and start talking to you about your idea and w inspire you. You know, he made you think you were better than you were half the time, right? And I was talking to John yesterday, and we were talking, well, you know, Bobby did that for me. Bobby did that for you. He went deeply into what we were doing. How many other people did Bobby do that for? And it must have been hundreds. <laughs> so there's the spark plug doing this. Now, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't the most, you know, not everybody loved him. Some people were shocked at some of the things he did, and he wasn't really nice to everybody. But if you were one of the people he was being nice to, I think you kind of thought he was nice to everybody. But <laughs> and, and he, you go. I was just going to say he, he, he provided space for a, a lot of rather extreme personalities. Somebody like Ann Craig was basically non-adaptive except at the pyramid. Or an Edgar Oliver, where could he have gone if not the pyramid? But I think it's also just maybe if you have never been there, the pyramid, uh, it was on the street, uh, uh, Avenue A between 7th and uh, 6th and 7th Street. Um, and you walk in, there's a really long bar. And then there was a cigarette machine and a nice machine. 
a, a, a stairway downstairs. But then there were these two doors that opened up to a back room where there was a dance floor. At the back of the dance floor, there was a very low platform, which, which eventually became a, a bit of a higher stage. So really, the, 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 the place itself allowed for people to, if they wandered in, whatever, they could drink at the bar, they could hang out, they could dance, they could watch a show unexpectedly. And genre-wise, it, it was really, there was zero attitude. I mean, I found, like, I remember I would, I would go and hang out in the lobby of the kitchen trying to get a gig. I was like, you know, it just wasn't going to happen. Because it was just, I, I, my work wasn't that, that far along, but also it was kind of an impenetrable performance art world, which was a very austere and very minimal. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't my thing. And also, um, you know, I was just messing, starting to mess up with gender, gender fuck, drag, all that stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, other venues, dra drag wasn't really part of their DNA. <coughs> and my, my kind of drag, you know. <clears throat> so um, it really became a place where it, it was home for gay, straight, punk, rock and roll, drag, trans, it was everything. And, and that never, st it never stopped functioning in that way. It really remained a very welcoming, safe space for people to discover themselves. And this thing of pulling people in, like Samoa was one of those people, just like he just described, his being pulled in like first day. And he became a regular performer there. He was, for a while you were the Japanese Jesus, and then you, you worked with Ken Brafaller on a lot of things. Uh, the voluptuous horror of Karen Black and all that. You know, Bob, Bobby uh, paired me with uh, Anne Craig. Oh. The back in the, the Anne Craig was uh, doing Cafe Iguana. Yeah, Cafe Iguana. Like every Sunday. Yeah, Anne Craig. Or yeah. every other Sunday, I don't remember. Yeah, I think And then Bobby was just like, why don't, why don't you do the show on Anne Craig's night? And it was like, I never did any shows before, <laughs> you know. Right. And I was like, okay, sure. And you made a spider costume out of foam. Yeah, the, foam. those, those, you know, it won't fry now. But I, you know, I found a queen size bed on the sidewalk. <laughs> so I took it on, I oh, cut it open inside. And I went inside, and I cut it as a spider shape. It's a queen size bed. <laughs> it's a miracle I didn't get the bed bugs. <laughs> but and that's this pyramid's typical set and costume of the pyramid. It was a lot of found material at the beginning, cardboard boxes, I think as you were saying, uh, you know, things from the appliance stores. And the pyramid changes decor like every week. So these people would do these insane designs and you'd go in and it'd be, you know, let's just say Paris or something. Next week, it would be the inside of a human body or something, which we did once, you know. Um, by the way, Agus knew sister back in South Carolina as well. So he he, he was an a, a, a early witness to stuff, and he's quoted in the book. Um, how are we doing? Is it time-wise? Is it our first half oh, hour? Fine. Tell us a little bit, why did you, how did you decide to write the book, and how did you structure it? How did we decide what? When did you decide to write the book? What was your impulse? Oh, well, how did you I, I always, I was always, you know, I moved away. I went to New Mexico for 10 years and then I went moved to Chicago. I was a college professor. And, and, but the thing was, I was always waiting. When is this book going to come out about the pyramid? There's a book about Cafe Chino. There's a, so much about La Mama, you know, and you'd, you know, you'd, you'd be reading a lot about the East Village. There were often magazine articles about pyramid or something, and but when is the book going to happen? And who knows? Who has heard of Bobby Bradley? And every and by this time, RuPaul was a huge star. You know, Lady Bunny was a big drag persona down here in in, in New York. All of that, good. But what about how it happened? How it started? Because Bobby booked thousands of performances. Bobby created the first club you know, east of First Avenue for that generation of people. I mean, there were tons of stuff culturally before that. So where's the book? Where's the book? I, you know, and then Bobby died. It, it's a tragic story. He unfortunately was an addict, but he also had AIDS. And, you know, that whole generation went down the tubes. We all did 
tons of stuff that was never videotaped because there were no video cameras there. There was no social media. There were barely even like, I remember when, you know, video rental play, VCRs were new, like in, in 82. So even at, I mean, I think 57 suffered from some of that same stuff. And that's why there's a dearth of material. So when when is it going to be? So I want to, you know, it's not that I, I'm an egomaniac, as my friends know, but I didn't really have that need to tell that story. I had other stuff I was doing, but I just thought it should be told. And, and I ran into Brian Butterick at a wig, wig stock in 05, actually. And I said, we should write a book about the period. You know, because Brian, the co-author, he wasn't one of those original people, but he did come. He was working there six months in already, and he was very much an insider from then on. He rose to be a manager there. So he's really the person who could be the verifier and the fact checker and, you know, corroborate things. And he was great. And then he really wanted, we, we all wanted it to be people's, you know, an oral history. And he especially stuck to, it's not going to be narrative. It's not going to be one thing. It's going to be all these people. So we could get the kaleidoscope because, you know, one person says one thing about anybody, Bobby, whoever, another person says a, a, a contradictory thing. That's what it's all about. That's what actually human society is. So let's have it. Let's have whatever you think the truth is. And I, I love it when those contradictions appear, you know, so yeah, and so we decided to write it. We, it took forever. We interviewed all these people. We had 400 pages at one point. We, that, you know, and so much of it overlapped into like things like Dance Ateria and Club 57 and, and um, you know, Limbo and all that. But we, we sort of cut out everything that didn't have to apply it directly to the pyramid or almost everything and, 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 and it took forever and then Brian died and then we couldn't get published, and then Jane Friedman said she'd publish it, and then actually she supported it in many ways, but it was published through the help of a foundation called Some Serious Business, and, and thank God Damiani stepped in to put us in their catalog and help promote it, and that's the story. It was, it was hard, it was excruciating. It never looked like it was gonna happen. How many years? Like, well, the first set of interviews started in 06. And then they went sporadically. You know, uh, Brian's health was in and out. Brian would come and stay with me in Chicago for weeks at a time and then go away. And then so sometimes. 15 years. Uh, uh, yeah, project, well, which is uh, often uh, what, book, off and on. what books take. About yeah. the Pyramid Club, what year did it open? When did it close down? It opened December. This manifestation of it opened in December of 1981. Uh, it, it only closed in like, I think, 22 or 23, but that was a way different. The real pyramid that we're talking about ended like around uh, 92 with the, the end of uh, the Black Lips Theater Group. And there were a lot of things, you know, there, were, there, there was drag there from the beginning, but it was, the drag thing got emphasized more. Things changed when, when AIDS and ACT UP started. There was a short time when it was like exclusively gay. That's less what we experienced. We experienced a very mixed thing. Uh, there were times when, you know, like I know Dani came in to DJ early on, but then she didn't stay, but came back later and became a very popular DJ. Uh, Jody Carrilla and Julie Hare, who's gonna come on the panel later. We'll talk about the later period in a minute. But, and, and so, yeah, go ahead. Pete, well, one here. thing that, um, John brought up the kitchen, and uh, one thing that um, I thought about at the time um, was that there was a kind of art class system in the East Village, and um, I had a lot of friends over on Second Avenue, people that I hung out with at the Fourth Street bar that John talked about, that looked down on the pyramid. They, you know, they thought it was kids and it, that it wasn't serious, and they, oh. well, I'm not going to tell you any names. I'll tell you later. But but I actually think also that as time went on, the pyramid kind of started to earn its props. And I think um, particularly as people like you and, and uh, Ethel and, and John and, and Tanya Ransom uh, and, and many others um, uh, used it as a venue for experimentation and they, and they developed their work um, that people 
started to come for that. And um, people that weren't necessarily interested in the partying and, and the dancing, um, but something serious was actually going on there too. Yeah, actually it, what wound up happening was that it was making such an interesting noise that the curators from Dance Theater Workshop, from Performance Space 122, they all came to the pyramid. I mean, that's how my career started beyond the pyramid. I was able to, I, well, my first gig outside of the pyramid was um, at La Mama. I mean, so, but, but they came to us and we laid down our own gauntlet and they liked what we laid down. Yes. And that, that opened up door, uh, possibilities for us. But again, Ellen Stewart like, came to see John Jesser and stuff. And, you know, people were excited about watching Arovich at Three Kings Kill Four. Yeah. And so that kind of slowly spread. But it's weird because they still thought the pyramid was a dive. Which it was, but it was this hotbed of creation at the same well, time. Well, and it never stopped being anarchic and, and DIY, and it was very DIY, so that nobody really knew where it was going. And, and again, I, I credit Bobby a lot because he was, he was able to, what do you call that when you can tolerate ambiguity? You know, he could tolerate a lot of things yeah. happening, and, uh, that, but, and gave it space to add up to something. And it took, a while. American press didn't write about it. The Voice didn't write about it for a long time. It took Wall Street Journal and New York Times to write about it. But Europe was full of press about about the pyramid even early on. And uh, it's funny how that happened. How, how many, are we doing time wise up? How, sorry, but how many evenings was it open in the week? Eventually, it was open every, every day. Night. It started one night. It turned to two nights, then three, and then it was the whole week. But it took a while. Eight nights a week, right? <laughs> yeah. And financially, <laughs> plus did, a few. Did, yeah. To get any support, did you bring it all yourself? How was that box office? How did that all work? Oh. Go support. Ahead. Meaning like funding or no, no, no. But the, the we, funding oh, was the, the we were train. well paid. Oh, actually, that, that's something I want to talk about for a second. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um. Because I, when I came to New York, I, you know, I was there at the tail end of the 60s artists. And I, you know, I sort of apprenticed under a lot of sort of avant-garde th theater artists of that time. And, and the, uh, the paradigm was that you got a little grant from the New York State Council, $5,000. And, you know, you, you paid for the theater and everybody got $250 for two months' work. And, um, but then the pyramid comes along and they have a bar. So they're actually making money. Right. So, um, you know, this is the point you make in the book. People got paid, but it, 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 it created a, a whole different kind of uh, economic system for artists, which was, uh, again, more by the seat of your pants, but also th there was more money in it. And that also meant that you had more money for um, production values and, and things like that. But Bobby would actually finance set building and things like that. And, and the message is asked you had to show your ass. The what? message sent by that money, Bobby gave you the whole door for the time you were performing. And, and, and except maybe for a little bit here or there, here. And it was a very generous spirit and it, it did wonders for people's enthusiasm, for their commitment to the club. And, and uh, it wasn't, you weren't nickeled and dimed out of anything. And yeah, the bar, the bar was a separate operation run by this guy, Richie, who owned the lease on the liquor license. But he said, you guys do whatever you want. He had a silent partner who was a cop. So there were cops left the pyramid alone. The mafia left the pyramid alone. And so was, they talked about 57 as being a place where people could freely operate. And that's what the pyramid was, but for slightly different reasons. Because, But it was a safe space. These kids, Bobby was so young and so was sister and all the people that we were all young, but they... They just wanted to create utopia. They weren't trying to get rich. They did get rich because so much poured in, but it, it never felt like there's this thing and you're working and you better produce and where are your people? And it was just support, support, support. Well, and to, to me, one of the, the, the qualities that cre it created was that it was non-institutional. And the arts has become so institutional now. Um, you, you know, uh, a friend of mine who was a theater artist, and, and Maria Irene Fornes, she always said that Off Off Broadway was killed by the grant system because you are trying to create, you know, you're trying to... Interesting. Uh, 
devise something that the grant donors will like or approve. And the pyramid didn't have, it, it, it wasn't beholden to anybody except for the people that came. And it just gave it a different spirit, which is very nice. On the other side of the, that coin though, there, it was a, a decidedly non-commercial space. And by that, I mean, so much of the work that was created there wasn't aiming to be appealing. Right. It was aiming for its own truth. It, 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 like for me, the death of art is, you know, when you're trying to appeal to an audience, how, how do you know what they want? I mean, it just, you know, I, and I've never been able to figure anything like that out. Uh, but so it, it really, um, you know what I'm trying to say? It really did provide a space where people could be the, yeah. their genuine selves uh, unconditionally. And if it flopped, it flopped. It didn't matter. People could dance when the show was over, whatever. It was, it was a very uh, Dance generous. and then watch Iris Rose's show about uh, horrible murders in New Jersey, you know? Because, yeah, that would be exactly the show that someone could say no to, you know? Yeah. But so maybe we switch, yeah. we switch over. And yeah. uh, we turn to the next Good. panel. And really, thank you. And uh... well, John, why don't you moderate now? Why don't you moderate? Julie here. Oh, there she is. All right, then, like, quickly, this, of course, you many of you know John Jesserin and Julie Hare. For those that don't, John is the genius behind Chang. Julie has a really varied career. She was part of Three Teens Kill Four. She was a door person for a long, long time. She curate, curated many of her own nights and theme parties at the Pyramid later on. And, and she can probably speak better than most of us about the later days. Um, and she's also still active in music. She's her band, Female Genius, just played at, at Howl recently and stuff. So uh, take it away, guys. Ta tell us the most important thing you you want you could tell us about the pyramid, especially if it hasn't been said. So first of all, I'll take this. Hello. Can I just ask? Um, how many people have not, uh, are are not from, did not grow up in the 80s like we did? Like, we didn't ever went to the pyramid, don't really understand what it was, or like, don't, like, could you just raise your hand? I'm really curious. So we're preaching to the choir for the most part, is, is, what, is all I wanted to know. How Thank many you. How many have been to the pyramid club? <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Then we don't even need to be here. This is right. <laughs> So, but what came to your mind when you listened to the stories? Uh, well, I was, I'm in the story, so uh, it's interesting to hear it um, uh, from, well, another but similar point of view. So, um, yeah, I also sort of just somehow ended up there. And... Um, so I started showing films there early on and I would say probably maybe January, February of 82. Um, then I got to know Bobby. Um, and then I suggested this idea of doing a weekly serialized uh, show. Um, and um, he, he said yes, but he said, how are you going to, write a new show every week. And of course, I didn't know, I didn't know how I was gonna do it, but I thought, well, I, you know, we, we'll figure it out. And he, uh, here he had, he was hiring somebody, or not hiring them, but uh, giving them, he said, you can have Monday night. And I didn't know, I, I said, why, why Monday? And he said, well, isn't that the night that they don't do theater on? I didn't even know that. <laughs> I didn't even know that. I said, oh, okay. Well, he said, that way more theater people will come. And I thought, well, theater people are not going to come. They, they didn't. But anyway, so here he he engaged uh, this show completely by somebody who had never done a live show in his life before. So that's kind of amazing that he would just say yes to something like that. But also, 
earlier, you know, on, I do remember my then boyfriend, Frank Maya, who eventually ended up playing there and was in Chang and did a, a lot of other things eventually. But um, the reason, the, the way I found out about it, he said, I think there's some sort of like a gay rock and roll club in the East Village, which was, as an idea was completely unheard of. Those two things just were not supposed to mix, at least in the way that uh, everybody grew up then. You don't mix uh, the two. And then here, that it was, it was a lot of other things too, but it was really that as well. You could go to this place and uh, there were uh, drag queens, but then there were also guys wearing jeans and a dress and a, I mean, all kinds of stuff was going on there. But it was this strange mix of what, what you weren't supposed to mix together. So that really is kind of what, what drew me into it. And then when we started doing Chang, yeah, I was telling Kasutis the other day, I said, if I had seen, if I was somebody else and had seen what I had made for those first couple of episodes, <laughs> and I was Bobby, I would have just fired me immediately. Because <laughs> it was really, uh, I don't really think I knew what I was doing or I was trying to do something, but um, it really was just, uh, we were floating a balloon up and hoping it would, we were gonna fool the audience enough to, to make it go. That was part of its charm though. You didn't have to have like a highly polished piece. Yes. And the way I sort of look at it, it's like going to an open mic. Like you might have to wade through some <laughs> stuff that you don't like or that you think is horrible. Yeah. But then there'll be like that genius moment that makes it so worth it that you came. Um, yeah. No, that's true. But I also have to say, it, it, talking about Peter, Peter was doing stuff there. But I was, it's interesting, Peter, because I was looking at what you were doing. I thought this guy actually, he is like a theater person. He actually knows what he's doing. He's doing like a, ideas of, you know, like theater ideas. And I'm just uh, throwing, uh, just making stuff up. And so I was watching you very carefully. Uh, well, <laughs> But you studied sculpture, right? Or? No, I, yeah, I studied sculpture. I, I didn't. I didn't have any. I didn't even like theater people. How did you get to New York, and how did? Uh, so I did. Um, I uh, no, I, I uh, studied sculpture. I have an MFA in sculpture. Uh, moved to New York. Became very interested in films. Then I started making these little films. Uh, then eventually, I ended up working. I ended up working for Dick Cavett, so I, I was the assistant to his producer for three years. And then um, it's interesting, at that time, by the time the pyramid was just opening up, the country had changed the culturally in a way. And so uh, Cavett was on public television uh, and the show was canceled. This was like the best talk show in America with all the smartest writers and everybody you know, was on that show. Uh, it was canceled by PBS. <laughs> so because enough, not enough people wanted to see it, even on PBS. So the whole country was kind of changing. So we were all fired from the show. I had nowhere to go. I was still kind of on a weekly uh, roll in my mind. And that's how I, I, I thought of let's do a show every week. And then that's when I showed up at the Pyramid Club. And... Um, and that's how I, I ended up there. But uh, but it was really a kind of a, it was just a fluke. I thought we'll do it for a few weeks. Um, also the idea was, let's just say, my idea was I don't have any money to uh, make any of these little film art films anymore. So why don't we just perform the film and the audience can be the film, the camera, and then we'll just perform it. Uh, instead of actually filming it. So everything was supposed to be very cinematic and that's all I cared about was uh, that it seemed like a film, so it was written that way. That was the whole idea and it really wasn't um, uh, about theater at all until very early on, probably the first episode, I realized there's something called stagecraft. Where it doesn't matter, if, even if you like theater or not, 
that you have to learn how to manage the space on a stage. And you learn the stagecraft from those techies, right? Well, a lot actually, of it. Yes, yeah. I think it's uh, just important to throw in all the names of these tech people. Chris Clemens, Rolf Romschick, John, uh, John Parker. Um, they, Here's when Parker. I got in there, Here's they Lamar. really ran me ragged. I, 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 and there was hardly any tech in the pyramid anyway, but they, they wanted to run it the way, you know, they, the best they could do it. So they made me write out like a, a lighting list of what lighting cues and stuff. I, I, I disagree that there was worked. hardly any tech. I have yet to recently had someone ask me um, what kind of lights I wanted my Earth. show and to provide a light person, which the pyramid always did. Yes, they always did that. And they were really intent, intelligent. And also, we were talking about this the other day, the, the amount of uh, artists that they had to deal with day after day after day uh, was um, like amazing. This one wants this, that one wants that. What are you going to do here? And uh, somehow they, they, they were, uh, they, to me, they really helped me figure things out because there weren't that many options, but at least they said, did you ever, did you ever think of this? Oh, Pierre Lamarche. Yeah, oh, Pierre Lamarche. Lamarche. But if you think um, about them, they, we would go and do our theater and we always felt like we were there a lot, lots of hours. But the thing was, those techies would arrive for sound check and they would stay there through the theater show, into the DJs, yeah. through the bands, through the late night weird performances of all kinds, and probably leave about 4 a.m. And then they'd be back for sound check the next day. So if anybody knows who, what went on at the pyramid better than us, uh, it would have been the top management, the, the techies, maybe also the bartenders, the door, and the door, door people. Door yeah. people yeah. But, but the Too door late, people... Yeah. The door people and the bartenders were there all night too and saw it, but they pretty much were at one station, right? And uh, I know you got around the club too, but the techies were circulating all the time. So there was a learning by doing and it was challenge business. But Julie, tell us about your work, how, your art, and how did you connect yeah. to the place? I just want to talk about like the logistics of how it ran. I mean, I, yeah. so... Um, I did work the door. I'd come in at like at nine and work until four. So you started out as at working at I the door? I started out working in coach who, who hired you? Um, Brian. From, I was playing in a band with Brian from Three Things Till Four, and he hired me to do coat check. And so I was working the coat check, and that was great because you could steal lots of money. We, we would recycle the um, tickets so I could make like $300 in a night. <laughs> but I didn't think I didn't, I didn't think of that. Somebody taught me how to do that. But um <laughs> uh, then um Brian so Brian would be like up standing around at the front of the club and a lot of people would come in that he would know and he'd always you know he was super friendly and Bobby was still working there too but this was when Brian was working there and so he'd wave a lot of people in and then he'd lose money that way so I had just moved here from like I grew up in North Carolina I, I went to art school in Kansas City and I had just moved here and I didn't know anybody so he was like you should do the door <laughs> and so I so I did and that worked but um I also want to talk about the musical component because there's been a lot of talk about the theater and the theater's fabulous and everything but <laughs> it, a lot of this stuff I didn't realize how how special it was like the mix of different media you know the fact that there was theater and rock and roll and performance and gay and straight and skinheads and hardcore and just like i didn't i didn't think of it at the time like i just i just didn't know the difference like i thought that's just how it was like you you'd go see a band like rat at rat r where the drummer looks like jim morrison and the singer is Victor Boisson Tet and he wants to run for president and he makes a does a performance and then they play like a, a, a very noisy noise rock show and then after that Sister Dimension comes and DJs uh, dance music and everybody's just like happy to ch to change gears and be like okay now I'm gonna dance like it's a disco like it, it just all came together really nicely and it's um, not like that now 
and I just have one more thing to say. Bobby really had a point of view. Like he came to see this band I was playing in before it became Live Skull. He came to our rehearsal and he was like, yeah, no, I don't want you guys to play there. But he also um, would make suggestions like um, Jesse from Three Teens and I started doing duets at the Pyramid because Bobby would be like, hey, why don't you guys do a duet? And we'd be like, okay. And then you just make something for it. So um, he had a he had a vision, and it's and I feel like that's what's really missing in a lot of venues now that book music and, and I'm sure whatever else you know the the arts in general. But now it's like what's your what's your metric on social media, and a lot of people don't have a point of view or are afraid like like it, during that time it was like those people were making the decisions on what they placed value on things that didn't have any value yet so that doesn't happen so much now can you talk a little bit julie about the time that your period of booking and what 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 you were what your vision was in curating theme nights and and bands and stuff when you were doing that so i got to know jody carilla who was a dj and she um was more tapped into the music business so she was booking um, bands from Caroline and Sub Pop and uh, these alternative label bands that would be touring. And so we decided to do this night together called Tuesday Night Fever. And my job was to um, find the local bands to play there. And, you know, again, it's something like I, f I feel like I didn't really know what I was doing at the time, but looking back on it, it, it was really a good pairing because I booked a lot of bands like Unsane and Cop Shoot Cop and Surgery and we booked Nirvana and we gave a lot of these bands their first shows and they you know went on to even some of the local bands went on to become successful and yeah it was a it was a rock and roll night and I had um, these hardcore kids that were working security for me and, and a biker guy that worked security and and um, it was a super successful series you know, on a Tuesday night. So, yay. I, I just want to mention also that Jody and I are both um, heterosexual women and cis women or whatever we want to, real girls, as Brian would say, real girls. And that's, that's the other thing I j just want to um, touch on is like, I don't look at the pyramid as like, this you know exclusively gay enclave or something or, or it was all drag queens because it was it was everything and everybody was welcome incredible yeah also to think i mean they people say great curators diaghilev who did the russian ballet for example who said oh, why don't we ask the painters the impressionists to do the backdrop you know of our bodies, nobody had ever thought of it, you know, to pairing and meet people who to do things they haven't done before um, creates um, 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 something. People say often new technology at meeting a tradition like music. What was new in the club? What you guys did, what others didn't do next to next to um, the decor? Yeah, I mean, tell he, a bit. Yeah, he mentioned that. But like, I mean, this still blows my mind to think about the fact that I pretty much attribute it all to Joey Horatio, who was an artist, and he would repaint and redesign the club literally every week so that if you went last week and you came this week, it'd look completely different. Like there'd be a wig museum or there'd be um, just some, you know, I can't, I can't remember all the stuff that he did, but it was it was amazing. I remember one month I was curating Wednesday nights and they did the theme, whatever was gonna be that Wednesday, would be the theme for the week. We had a complete Russian Tsarist pyramid club when we had a pyramid club that was the inside of a human body. And, and then we had a pyramid club that was a Central American Republic that was having a civil war. <laughs> you know, that's three. I don't remember the fourth, but there was one. <laughs> so I don't know, but that, but that's just, that was just the one I remember the other, that went on, you know, week in, week out, year in, 
year out. Yeah. The quality was amazing. It was really, really well done. It was a it was a dangerous place. Not only the art that was done with it, but also getting there, right? And you said that you had the security. Tell us a bit. But people also we all don't realize fully how different um, that was. Was there a police there? What did it all face? Was there any interference? What happened on those streets in front of the police. club? Uh, you know, I think yeah, I never, never saw police. But but the thing was, I don't. I think the danger was more of a myth. I mean, I never once had any trouble going to Avenue A to go to the pyramid. But I think that the standing perception, you know, there was an idea once in the 60s that New York was getting very dangerous. And then by the 70s, the danger somehow, the dangerous remaining sector was down there on the Lower East Side. And there was some crime and stuff too. There was lots of heroin sales and drug sales. But in terms of people getting really violent crime, maybe some of you experienced it there. I never did. None of my friends ever did. Um, there were people who died. Chris Morse got in an alter, a doorman got in an altercation with a patron, got beat up. There's a very sketchy story there. He died later that night. Another pyramid staffer, a black man, was killed by the police, uh, but on his way home from the pyramid on on the train, subway trains. And there are stories about that. And uh, the thing that would have proved police, this is Michael Stewart, for those of you who don't know, was a big case then. And uh, the thing that would have proved whether he had been mistreated by his police would have been, the evidence would have been in his eyes, apparently. And the, somehow the coroner lost his eyes. Sorry. And then all the, you know, all the testimony was from policemen. But he was, you know, he was... Who knows what happened? Something ugly happened. He was a very sweet guy. Uh, but that was at 14th Street subway station. That wasn't. Yeah, the that was in the altered. What I'm saying, I'm trying to figure out the dangerous East Village. Well, so there's I'm, the danger I, from the cops. So what Brian always told me is like if somebody's coming in, like, um, like some, uh, like a biker or anybody who's like made part of a crew or has seems to have an agenda or be threatening or whatever. It's much easier to not let those people come in than to get them out afterwards. So you just have to be really diplomatic and talk to them about how they're disrespecting you because people were, this is what he told me. <laughs> people respond to that if you say, like, well, I think you're disrespecting me. Please don't do that. And he also told me sometimes it's better for us to call the cops than if somebody else is going to call the cops on us, like if there's something going on in the club uh, and that person's going to go out and like, or that person's going to, you know, call the cops, it's better if we call the cops first. Did you ever see any violence in the club, Julie, in all your time? No. Then? Yeah. Incredible. I wish, I, I don't know of a venue at the moment where you have rock and roll performance films, interior uh, redesigns of a music lab. It's, it just sounds a sensational uh, uh, a place. Maybe we open up and to some questions or some comments or, or yeah, something. So I'm going to go around and you introduce us. We already know who you are, but still. So. Well, I, I, I've been wanting to ask this all during the conversation. Julie, I love uh, Three Teens Kill Four. Can you talk about it a little bit? Oh. Um. So yeah, it's so random how I ended up playing in Three Teens Kill Four. I, I moved here after being in art school with my boyfriend and he was managing a band and then I he started working at Danceteria and then I met um, everyone who was from Three Teens. They were all working in nightclubs as busboys. So I just kind of randomly met them and then they mentioned that they needed a drummer, and I didn't play drums, but I said I would help them rehearse, and I just went and bought a drum machine, and I didn't know how to play anything, any instruments at all. And um, that's how it happened, and then I was just like, I never left. Um, my name is Matthew Shipp. Um, just to answer your question about police or anything in there. There was one incident one night, um, a, a female friend of mine 
who, when she got high, she, you know, her personality changed and she could get violent. Um, did try to light somebody on fire one night. <laughs> and, and and Lewis was actually the door person. And Lewis was friends with her too. Oh, yeah. Lewis came back and he said to me, "Look, I know you're. I know you're friends with her. Just get her out of here. We gotta call the police." And so I I got her out of here, took her home, and made sure you know. And and actually, Lewis and I ended up kind of bonding as friends after that night because we had had a very weird beginning, you know. Um, but anyway, that's the only time I saw, you know, and that's how it was dealt with. Paula Shunison remembers somebody trying to pee on somebody in there. So, <laughs> oh, he peed on Paula Shunison. Oh, yeah, and, and and Ethel chased the guy down the street or something, saying, "Pee on me, pee on me." Yeah. <laughs> yeah I just Violence. Wanted, oh, sorry. I just wanted to to share a couple of memories. Uh, you know, I went to the pyramid first before Bobby and crew had taken it over. Somebody tried to turn it in, into a gay bar. This was like yeah. maybe six months before. before. And I went to the opening with a friend and I lived at like 14th and 2nd at the time. And yeah, to go to First Avenue, there was like the rock and roll bars, 8th Street. And then Avenue Way was always a little bit like, woo. Yeah. And uh, they had like bagels and cream cheese. There was like 30 people. It was like, this is not going to work. And then I went back there like eight months later. It was jammed. There was some band on the stage. I don't know if they were pouring blood. I don't know what it was, but it was just like, it was like this dark, crazy thing. And I also remember the thing of like East Village Gay versus West Village Gay. <laughs> and there was a, a, a little banner, the Pride Parade, uh, like East Village Gays Against Facial Hair. Because all the guys in West Village had mustaches. It was the F word. At F-A-G-S against uh, facial hair. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that was a, that's what these guys mentioned, uh, that Keith Herring designed that, that uh, stencil and stenciled it around the whole East Village. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's part of the Keith Herring collection now. And it's Real quick, one apparently. performance, John Kelly, uh, I don't know if it was a benefit or something, it was, Joni, Joni, and Joni. So it was like three Joni Mitchells from various stages of their of her career. Very folky Joni, more like uh, you know mid career Joni, and then jazz Joni. And I don't remember which hey. one you were. Brian Butterick was jazzy Joni when she had the perm, which was a bad idea. I think Jesse was. I don't know which one Jesse was. We all had blonde wigs on. And I was, I don't know which Joni I was, maybe the flaxen haired ingenue or something. But yeah, that's where we started doing that show with the Pyramid Club on the, for, for the first wig stock. But then we went, started doing it in clubs like the Cat Club and the Pyramid Club. But there's a great Andy Weiland photo of the three of us in the three blonde wigs. Thank you for remembering that. It was gorgeous. Real quick, one last thing. I went there one Valentine's Day and someone had mixed up a batch of electric Kool-Aid, which of those who, you know, who, who don't know, it's like, Kool-Aid laced with LSD, so which I kind of like. So I had a couple of cups. <laughs> I got high. It was fun. Anyway, anything goes at the pyramid. That's written about in the book, but also Bobby stood there inviting people to have some without telling it what was in it. So some people thought that was evil, which I I think I I don't think I'd like that. But I I remember it. I didn't have any though because I was afraid, you know. <laughs> One of the big learning curves for me was trying to um, pay the drag queens that danced on the bar at the end of the night before I'd got really gotten to know them because the transformations were so intense and amazing. And then, you know, I'd see them when they came in and then I'd see them later and I just wouldn't even be able to put two and two together. Hi, I'm Liz. I want to thank everyone who is part of the panel, first off. Um, I um, want to second what Julie said about, like, you know, the, the rock and roll part, because I was a little hardcore. I, I moved here in 82, found the pyramid right away. I still live in the neighborhood. Um, and I went there because the whole mix was like home. It felt like I finally found a place that you could be anything. So I'm not a performer, I'm a filmmaker. I'm the one making the documentary about the um, Pyramid Club. Um, but I wanna tell a funny story 
about this, this band, which you might know this, Julie, but um, Virus is a New York band. They only put one EP out, very good, but they were supposed to perform at the Pyramid Club on whatever night. So the singer, this Russian guy, went in the Pyramid Club the night before and started gay bashing people and they kicked him out of the club, but they didn't want to not have the gig go forward. So they wired his mic out to the sidewalk. So the band was playing in the back of the club, and then he was outside singing. As soon as he started like, one, two, three, four, with their song, the cops like rolled up on the, um, on the sidewalk, and that was over. But anyway, I just thought that was a great story. Yeah. So there you go. Another question or comment? Um, the book is fantastic. I'm only 70 pages in it. I'm really, really kind of, you know, even though I was there in the mid 80s a lot, learning a lot about the first couple of years, um, you do really point, I mean, it, it, it keeps coming at you that Bobby was a visionary of sorts or had, had a vision. But at the same time, as you're talking about, was his genius just being organic and letting things go or or how would you define because it did grow into something that's so unique even in new york even in new york clubs i mean pyramid culture has its own very special aura um how much do you attribute it to just being open bobby or you know just despite the fact that there was a vision or I attribute vision it to really having pointed. a point of view. I feel like a lot of people don't know what their point of view is. Right. And he knew he had a point of view and Brian had a point of view about, and they just followed that. Right. Just wait, Pete. Uh, uh, it was a magnet for outsiders all over the country. The sore thumbs of the nation gathered in the East Village, and they they really just needed a, a permission or a, a spot to open up. And 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 also the East Village was already quite different from the West Village. A lot of the values that you're talking about in the club, that that there's no real distinction made between the gay men, the gay women, the straight women. The, um, that was true of the West Village. It was uncool even to make a big fuss about being gay. You were you were what you were, kind of. Um, so it seems to me that really what Bobby did was that he 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 saw it and he understood it and he just um, made the place available. And as you say, he also was good at kind of guiding and um, so on. But it had a lot to do with that era and, and, and the, you know, that one brief shining moment kind of. bring this poster along to give to Castutis, but it's from a show at the Limelight that Bobby produced that William and I were in in April, and Lisa, who's also here. Uh, so he didn't just die after he stopped oh, he working at the, the pyramid, limelight. but I could pass this around if you want to just take a look at it. But um, the, the vibe that I loved so much about the East Village in general and the pyramid was, I mean, girls weren't always welcome at gay clubs. I worked at Fire Island as a construction worker, and they wouldn't even, I mean, they wouldn't play anything. Yoko Ono was a criminal. You know, it was only the same, like repetitive, don't, don't, don't use it. You know, there was the gay cliques. There were, um, there were straight, you know, macho bars didn't, ex it was just so great to have a place where people just had fun. I mean, we had so many drink tickets, <laughs> you know, that uh, we were sometimes, uh, you just felt that, um, it had this feeling like you were in Europe. Even the East Village, in, the, in a sense, was smaller. Every buildings were smaller. You'd feel a sense of relief yeah. when you got to the East Village. I lived in Kipps Bay at first, oh. and all I would do was walk to the East Village. That was everything I did was in the East Village, and uh, and they had the feeling at the Pyramid. They had those ta the, the tables that were on the side that were higher. There were different levels. You know, you right. just it had a coziness and. When people danced on the bar, it wasn't like, you know, I'm grinding sex hair on the bar. It was so joyful. Joyous, yeah. It was a great joy to the place. Well, my name is Avin Galietti, and um, I met Bobby 
1981 and in a gay bar in West Village. And uh, I took him to the Anvil and uh, the Anvil was a great place. It was an after hours place where you had uh, dry queens, you had go-go boys on the bar and uh, you, for $3, you had um, the kid from the Bronx and the uh, diplomat from Finland, you know, mingling, whatever. So, but I think uh, Bobby liked the anvil and I get some of the anvil, you know, I could recognize a little bit in the pyramid later. So then he told me, you know, he wanted to open this club. So I, um, I you know, I introduced him to some of my friends among which Phoebe Leger, you know, and Eric. I was there the first night. I still have the poster of the first night called On the Range. Yeah. And um, I remember very vividly the performance by John Kelly. It was very powerful. I mean, I remember. And uh, anyway, so then the pyramid uh, in February, 82, Bobby allowed me to have a benefit for a little film I wanted to do on the West Side Pier. So it was a great uh, success uh, for me because, I mean, my friends performed and, you know, there was some money and we managed to get some money in February. Then other friends of mine performed like Yolanda Hawkins, who just talked, and William, and uh, we need a connect to her. We, with, the, with the company, through comedy, they did a performance there, like Night With No Name and other others. And Yolanda was uh, also in the John Jason show, you know, Chang. And, uh, and that show, Baci Italiani, was also performed at the Pyramid, you know. Yes. And John, yes. So many... And it was more like performance, theater performance they were doing. Yes. Anyway, so I live still in the neighborhood, so the neighborhood uh, pyramid was my home. <laughs> Incredible. We are slowly coming um, to the end um, of the evening. Um, I mean, whatever Thank you, Frank, you for still want us. to say, but w I would like to ask you, what do you think we can we learn for the moment? It's a difficult moment for theater. It's a difficult moment for the arts in the city. What can we learn? What could still be applied and what not? Well, if you look at... I mean, for me, it's just that street level accessibility, visionary uh, producers or artistic directors who really care about the artists, especially the developing artists, uh, uh, break a, breaking away from the commercial model, but still having some way to... to support the artist financially that isn't ha having to do with uh, voluminous grant applications or whatever, a very direct connection. And that joy, I mean, it has to be a cultural, remember we were inherit, we, we grew up in our teens thinking we'd inherit this 1960s, all that celebratory, you know, druggy, fun culture that was also quote unquote expanded consciousness and I think the pyramid was also a last gasp of that. But that's also just a human celebratory impulse that that people, theater makers, artists, people who are in the lively performing arts, dance, you know, all this stuff, they need to bring that joy to an audience and that love. And and uh, I think it'll happen. Those phenomena will happen. I love what you said about little spaces, that if there are enough little spaces, um, you know, maybe young people will catch fire. But I think you need those visionary people. You know, I taught at an acting school for many, many years in Chicago, and they all band together and start theaters when they get out of school, though, because they already know how difficult it is in that commercial. But they, it's, it's sort of like their key to quote unquote success that someday they'll get jobs as working at the real sheer joy of that insane theater making exhibiting your idea that explosive quality of 60s performance or whatever isn't quite there and they last a couple years and they go away but bobby had that joy and you know we need bobby's not the only person like that yes, and, he was, mm -hmm. and, and the thing is i think it all can happen without drugs and and you know it, it, it you know it it the, the Th that was part of the East Village environment. It was infected with heroin from top to bottom. And, and it's surprising that there weren't more mm -hmm. people who got sick with addiction yeah. like that, you know? Thank you. Yeah. So anyway, that's my take. Uh, John, is there? Um, no, no, I, I, I do mic, have a, But you know, the other thing about the pyramid was that um, it 
wasn't just a bunch of, uh, not to be rude in a, a CUNY, it wasn't just a bunch of MFA students banding together after they've graduated. Right, right, it right. It was people of all, a lot of people had not been even been to college. They'd never been to theater. Uh, they went to see bands. They went to see, you know, they were into all kinds of stuff, or maybe they weren't into theater or they weren't into dance. Or, uh, somehow they all ended up there together on all different levels of, uh, of um, income and uh, education. Also, Bobby, you know, he, he did have a view of culture. Um, you know, he loved to talk about writing and writers uh, also. Um, and so he had a view of what was happening in the culture. He was actually the first person, I mean, that I remember hearing uh, say the word queer culture. So back in 82, no, nobody was ever even talking about that. Uh, so anyway, he had this view. So I'm just saying that that it was this mix of all kinds of people. And also before we, I have to mention Anne Craig, uh, who um, was this woman <laughs> that uh, to me was really like, a, she was kind of like a muse. She uh, announced, would announce a lot of um, the shows. Uh, she, she was assigned by Bobby to announce my shows and introduce the show and every week, um, she would say what happened in the week before, and so, but she would, she would, uh, she was an MC. What? She was an MC. Well, an, like an MC, yeah. But I'm saying she was more than an MC to me. Uh, she would make me, she would go down to the basement and she'd ask me, what is this show about? And tell me all the, you know, what you're thinking about it and all that kind of stuff so that she could then go up and, and she'd write a whole, I don't know where these things are now. She'd write a whole thing down to of notes of what she was going to tell about the last episode and what it might mean and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, she was very involved in, in all that kind of stuff. And then eventually, because she had uh, her own problems, Bobby ended up firing her, and then I ended up had to take it over. But typical Bobby, in a, in a, in a great way, I said, but Bobby, she, you know, I've just lost the MC. Who's going to announce the show now? And he said, well, you are. It's your show. <laughs> I mean, this was great that he just assumed, well, of course, you are going to do it now. You have to do it. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm just saying that it was, it was just a mix of uh, so many uh, kinds of Americans in there and also Europeans and Japanese. You know, all, it was filled with the, the – it was a very international um, – thing going on inside there as well. Lots and of uh, South Africans fleeing it, that it, apartheid. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Really, what do you yeah. forgot the question. What what do you think? What can we take from that? It's not the time is gone. It's someone said like the snowman, you know, it's gone. It's not the let's see it, the nature of the way of but still there's the picture of it. But also what can we learn or what do you think could also be inspiring for the moment in um, when I think about it, I think about it in terms of being an artist and when I get, for myself, when I get in trouble is when I start um, being a validation junkie and I think it's hard not to be uh, consumed by validation the way things are and I'm really glad that I'm old enough to know what it's like to live in a world without the internet and without social media because none of this stuff just even crossed my mind. Like I I just, you know, it wasn't like, I mean, I was recently playing with a project with this woman doing music and she's much younger and and she just, she wants to get signed. Like that's her goal, you know, that's her motivation. And like that can't be my motivation, um, the, the result, the end product. That cannot be the motivation because if you, if you're not having a good time while you're doing it, um, it's no fun. And it's taken me a long time to trust myself and my my taste about things. And so, you know, finally, <laughs> six decades in, I'm like, yes, I, had, I think I do have some good ideas sometimes. Amazing. So I would like really to thank you. Is there something really to learn from it, the mixture of styles? mixture of people, mixture of 
global representation and a lot of love came up also in the fa before the family that this is a place that's like home so um so it's it's quite unusual you know uh, who these people who created those places kept them up and Kestutis, thank you for putting it into a book we do books here we know how complicated that is this was like a 15 year effort and it's uh, what shows so it's a lot of respect um, for putting it into a, a memory machine that people can open, read it backwards and forwards, look at the pictures. So all our respect. Thank you for everybody Favor who of love. made it. Thank uh, you the very clubs, much. The Johns and everybody. And I think a big thank you to everybody on the panels. And the books for sale in the lobby. Oh, okay. So we're going to do a little... Uh, so the book is so the book come you can bring the books inside. There's a few left, and they can all be signed tonight. It's very rare to have everybody here. So get the book. There are eight left, eight or ten. Bring them inside, and there's going to be a little reception. We are going to have a little bit of wine. So thank you.